Hello humanoids, welcome to Halfling Hobbies. I'm Halfling Hannah, and there is no good segue to today's topic. I have tried so many times and they're all terrible. Hello humanoids, do you have a shrine to your crush made out of used bubble gum in your closet? No, that's too old school. Nobody gets that reference. Hello humanoids, do you wonder what it would be like to start your own cult? God, no, that's so dark. Ugh. Hello humanoids. Have you ever worshipped a statue so hard that it came to life? No. Nope, that's too coy. Not doing that one. Yeah. There's just no way to introduce cults without it being weird because it's cults. So today we're going to talk about cults in D&D. And we're going to do this because it's really f <laughs> sounds so terrible. It's really fun. It's really fun to have cults in your D&D, and it's really fun to have your party encounter them. It can add some awesome plot points, maybe some side quests, some villains, some lower level bosses. Like, they're just in general really great things for Dungeons and Dragons. Just for Dungeons and Dragons, though. Do not take this and make your own cult. But we're going to talk about <laughs> how to make your own cult in Dungeons and Dragons. Here we go. Okay, humanoids, before we get started, I have a question for you DMs. Yes, all of you DMs. I would love it if these videos became an awesome resource for any DMs coming to them in the future. And in order to do that, we need some good comments. So here is your question to answer. If you could make a cult in D&D, what would it be? So down below, come up with a cool, crazy, kooky, creepy cult and put it down in the comments below. All right, humanoids, if you want to make a cult, you need to think about six things. Now remember, this is for Dungeons and Dragons. Use this only for good. Don't use this for evil. <laughs> but the first thing you need to think about is the definition of a cult, which is it is worship or veneration of a particular person or object. So the first thing we need is a particular person or object. This can be an ent highly intelligent monster. This can be a magical item like the Hand of Vecna. This can be pretty much anything that you can imagine in Dungeons and Dragons that people might think is worthy of worship. Or if you're the little fish people, e literally anything at all. <laughs> and then it'll come to life and be a god and it'll be great. But when you are thinking about a cult, the first thing you need to do is start with a person or an item. The next thing you need to do is you need to think about followers. So the followers of this cult in real life and in your Dungeons and Dragons campaign, the reason that cults exist is because people desperately need something from them, whether it's hope for the future because they are oppressed or it's power or it's, you know, some kind of earthly pleasure that they gain from it. Whatever it is, there should be some kind of benefit to the followers. So you need to think about, okay, what does this person or object give to their followers and who might those followers be? Are they the extremely rich and powerful who kind of have their own little secret society with this item that they've either made or found? Or is it the common poor people who are looking for someone to be their savior and their hope? Um, so who are your followers and what benefit are they getting from your cult? So that's number two. Number three, who is the leader of your cult? You really need to think through this because it's not just the person being worshipped. There should be like kind of a hierarchy in your cult. So there's the, the one being worshipped, then just below them is like some kind of prophet or um, someone very close to them who communicates directly with them. Now they should be probably the only person who communicates directly with them. Then under them, you kind of have the high priest kind of a thing, or uh, in some cases, these might be the high level druids or elders. And then under them, you have all of the rest of the people. So there should be this little bit of a hierarchy and you need to think through who those people might be, especially that person who communicates directly with the item uh, or person being worshipped. Number four, what is this cult's goal? 
There is no altruistic cult. <laughs> That's not how they work. They want something from those that come to them. So think through what are the goals? What is it that this cult wants from its people or in general? And most often those people that come to the cult, they are simply going to be a means to an end. They are going to provide them with something that gets them closer to their goals. Number five, iconography, which is a fancy word for symbols. So each cult should have their own symbol. This is something that their followers can graffiti on walls or something that they can turn into jewelry to show that they are a part of that cult. It should be something kind of low key um, so that other, it doesn't like draw attention. It shouldn't say, I'm in a cult or something like that, uh, but it should be something that's particular to that cult. And then to go along with that, you need to have some secret language. Secret language is number six. So come up with some like um, response things. So if one person says something, there's a, a phrase that is the correct response to that. Um, that's another way for cult members to identify one another. Um, they don't have to go up and be like, hey, do you worship that one dude? Yeah, it's pretty awesome, right? No, they're gonna be way more subtle about that, especially in uh, campaign settings where only certain gods are allowed. Uh, they're gonna be really, really low-key about uh, finding other people that worship the same god as them. So they're gonna have these phrases that they can just throw out to see if the other side knows the correct response. And then if they do, they know that they're a part of that cult. Now, the best way to understand these six is through examples. And so I'm gonna give you three examples from my own campaigns of cults that I use and have absolutely loved. Now, it's, n gosh, I sound like such a sadistic DM. <laughs> when I do things like this. But I love to have cults in my Dungeons & Dragons campaign because it's such a cool little side quest or side story. And in one of my campaigns, that cult was the entire plot of the campaign and uh, stopping what it is that they were doing, which is actually my first one that I'm going to give you, which is the Servants of the Star. Now, this is best like kind of laid out in my DMs uh, sheet that I made for this. I made a, a DM page for cults and I uh, laid out this entire cult on there. I'm gonna give it to you for free down in the description below. Um, if you like that and you want more resources like that, then maybe consider going over to Patreon and supporting me there because I create DM resources, DM binder pages, and I give them out on Patreon every single month. So it would be really cool if you wanted to support me over there. But if not, you have a cool cults page. You're welcome. So, what is the cult? That's not a cult. They don't call themselves a cult. That's the one thing you should have. They'll probably get mad if you call them a cult, first of all. So, servants of the star. So, the servants of the star, the number one, the thing being worshipped, is what's called a star spawn. Star spawns are found in Mordekainen's Tome of Foes. By the way, how do you say that? Mordekainen's? Mordekainen's? How do you say that? Tell me down below, because I'm sure that I say it wrong. That's okay, but it's in this book. So if you want those particular stats and a full explanation of what a star spawn is, you can head to page 235 in Mordekainen's. Star spawn are really cool because they come from a far away galaxy where it's all about insanity and madness. Everything is just crazy out there. And sometimes star spawn find their way into the material plane on comets. So that is the thing being worshipped here is a star spawn who is on his way to Earth. Who is the followers here? Well, the followers here are actually the poor, the destitute, and the marginalized, because what this cult preaches is that when the master comes on the star, he is going to overturn the current system. The, the monarchy, those that are in power, will be underneath the feet of those whom they have oppressed over all of this time. It's going to be the poor who will rise up and have power and strength. That's what this cult teaches and preaches. And the main person who does this is the leader, Silas Thatcher. 
Silas Thatcher has his own villains sheet also down in the description below that I use for him. He once was a contributing member of society until he broke his leg and became crippled and could no longer work. He ended up becoming homeless and on the streets, very bitter against the, the current way that society works. So Silas Marner, one day he started hearing a voice in his head of the master, this is the star spawn, speaking to him, giving him visions of the future, telling him that he was coming to earth and that he would change everything if Silas would do everything that he asks. Of course, Silas being nothing but a poor and destitute man in the current society was eager to jump on board with the promise and the hope of a better future. And he became the prophet only known as the prophet, he is the only one to whom the master speaks. And he passes on his message of good news for the poor throughout all the major cities. And it has grown exponentially because so many people are looking for hope. So these followers, they can actually be found in every major city and there are some full villages dedicated to being servants of the star. The next thing that you wanna talk about is that hierarchy and everything. Well, you have obviously the star spawn, then you have Silas Thatcher. Under him, you have 100 loyal servants. And these are, of course, the servants of the star. They're the loyal servants. They are the only ones who know the location of the master's landing area, also called King's Landing. So King's Landing is like this temple area out in the woods that um, they've created and that they've set up for the arrival of the master's comet. He is, in fact, coming to Earth on a comet. So the goals. The next one is the goals of this cult. Well, the goals of this cult are to collect the magical items that the master tells Silas that he needs present when he arrives, and also to collect loyal members. So they are trying and proselytizing to everyone in the area to collect as many loyal members as possible to receive the master's blessing when he finally arrives on Earth, which is a pretty easy sell. The cult asks nothing of its people and um, the, the people meet uh, every once in a while to receive updates from the prophet on the arrival of the master. Here is the iconography, very simply, is a comet. So uh, my, my party would find comet necklaces. They would find comets engraved in certain areas which actually indicated where the cults would meet. And then the, the language, one cult person would say, at the dawn, and the correct response is, we will rise. And then another one, so I always try to do two or three, uh, depending on how I'm feeling at the time. Uh, but the, the next one that was used a lot was when stars fall, and the correct response was, so will they. So you can see how those six things, when you think about them, really kind of create this whole little system and this whole cult for you. Um, and in a way that feels very real and very lifelike in a kind of a terrifying way. So that was the one that I actually used as the entire plot for my campaign, because if you read about Starspawn in Mordekainen's, Mordekainen's? Eh. Uh, then you know exactly how absolutely terrifying it would be for one of them to land on the material plane. So the whole purpose of it was for the party to figure out where that star spawn was going to land and be there when he did and defeat him before he could kind of take over the material plane. It is a challenge rating 16, so you're definitely gonna want your party to be a little beefy by the time that they get there. Next one, person of worship, a fallen angel, actually called a radiant idol. This comes from Eberron, very back of Eberron on page 308. So if you have a copy of Eberron, if you go to 308, you'll see radiant idol. So a radiant idol is actually a fallen angel. And you know that angels are lawful, good, celestial beings created by the gods to be their servants, their messengers, and sometimes their very presence on the battlefield for causes of good. Well, when an angel allows their pride to take hold or does an act of extreme evil, they can become a fallen angel. And these angels are cast away from the celestial plane into sometimes the material realm. And sometimes these angels wish for vengeance or gather mortals to worship them 
as gods. That's what's happened in this case. So the one being worshipped is the angel. He is the leader of this cult uh, because he doesn't trust anyone else to do it. Only he can do it. And this angel has charmed um, very rich and powerful people. So those are the followers. Rich and powerful and beautiful people that he can charm to do his will. And his goal is to gain as much power and as many powerful items as possible for him to take over the material plane. As much of it as he can. Now, he wants to do this to spite the god that cast him out. So sometimes the very top leadership of a cult can truly understand the, the madness or the evil that um, they are worshiping while everyone else doesn't. This would be one of those cases. So the very top loyal, the very richest, most powerful people would understand those true goals of this fallen angel was to take over the material plane. And they're okay with that because they want power for themselves, right? If you're in good with the one who's controlling everything, then you got it made. However, the rest of the people have been fed this lie, and this is the lie that the angel spreads and that is spread throughout the realm, is that this angel was trying to bring the cure to disease to the material plane. He saw mortals suffering from illnesses and pain and decided he would steal from the gods the ability to get rid of all disease. But before he could make it to the material plane with this item, he was was found out by the god and punished for his deed, cast down from the celestial plane. Now what he is seeking is people to come around him to restore him to his former glory so that he can go and get the item and bring it to the mortals. This is why the people are following him, this hope that, um, that all sickness will soon be eradicated. This works especially well in a plague-torn area. Uh, so if you're running a D&D campaign and you've included like diseases and a plague, maybe interject this cult in there. It's a, it's a perfect way. They go hand in hand. It works really, really well. And sometimes... Oh, that's so dark, but I just had a thought that uh, the angel might actually unleash plagues in certain areas in order to gain followers. Because remember, he's not good anymore. He is an evil creature. And so uh, it might that might be a way also for your party to to find this cult, is that they're trying to figure out why this area has been struck by plague. And it leads them to this cult and to this fallen angel. Oh man, oh that's so dark, but it's so good. Oh, anyway, <laughs> sorry. I'm not evil, I promise, I'm not evil. I swear, I'm, I'm neutral, I'm neutral. I'm chaotic neutral DM, we'll call me that. Um, uh, so the iconography for this, I imagine a slender, beautiful hand holding a torch, which is like the representation for um, this angel who was trying to bring light into the world but got snuffed out. And the secret language in this would be um, like the leader in of the cult, like the preacher that's standing up there, would say, he brings us blessings. And the correct response from the audience would be, he brings us strength. Uh, and then another one might be, he is our protector, and the response would be, he is our advocate. And then the last example of a cult that I'm going to give you is one around an object. Because remember, it doesn't have to be a person, it can also be an object. So in this case, the object is a strange portal. Now, this group has found this strange portal and begin to investigate it. They don't understand the ruins around it or where it leads, but they do know that once every year, this portal becomes active. And if nothing is sent through, then nothing comes through the portal. However, if they send through a worthy gift, then strange artifacts are sent through this portal that they um, are very powerful magic items that are not fully understood, but they keep and research. So what's happened is they've actually begun to worship this portal and become all obsessed with it and the items that come out of it. 
Now the leaders of this would be um, a collection of scientists. I imagine that they didn't they didn't start worshiping this portal, but something about it has completely obsessed their minds, maybe even given them some traits of madness. And they guard it like viciously. They keep this secret so close at hand. Uh, and all of the items are treated as relics, as like holy relics that have come from this portal. The followers of this would be a very, very small group, only those that these initial people would consider as useful. And then I imagine that after they've outlived their usefulness, they would kill them to ensure that no one else finds the portal. Now, these magical items are by no means stable because they're not from this world and they were not designed to work within this world. So occasionally, if one of these wizards or um, scholars tries to use this item, it could create really horrible, disastrous events. And yet, they cannot help but continue to experiment with these items and to continue to, ser to send um, gifts through in order to receive more. They have found through experimentation that the best gifts come when they send through worthy adventurers and fighters. So throughout the year, they hold kind of these gladiatorial games to find the very best and the strongest, which they then say they're going to give a great reward to, but then they take them to this poor and send them through. That might be a great way for your players to actually find this portal is for them to participate in these gladiatorial games and win. Or maybe their greatest fighter has been kidnapped and they have to find him before the, he gets sent through this portal. Or perhaps they're trying to find out why these devastating um, like disasters keep happening in this one area and their investigation eventually leads them to this cult. That might be some different ways that they can actually find this cult. So the iconography for this is the portal. Uh, itself with these strange runes on it, which the scientists are obsessed with, even though they don't understand what these runes mean. They're absolutely obsessed with them. So they have this portal with these runes on it. And some of the secret language for this, I would say, would um, be different ways to refer to the portal without it being obvious what they're talking about. Um, so the gate or heaven's gate. Oh, nope, that one's bad. That was an actual cult. <laughs> I guess it works. If you want to use Heaven's Gate, it might be like a little Easter egg in your campaign to see if your players know about real life cults, I guess. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. Oh, so... <laughs> this is not good. This is... I mean, I hope it's good. I hope you've enjoyed this. So, cults are creepy. And they're honestly kind of hard to talk about because they're so prevalent in today's world. And you do not have to use them if you don't want to. However, they do make some really cool plot points, side quests, and little um, like mini bosses. Uh, leaders of cults can make an excellent mini boss before your actual big bad. And I highly recommend if you haven't tried using a cult in your campaign before, maybe sprinkle some in there. They don't have to be like huge, super dark and creepy cults. You can even make them about some smaller items or magical items or um, just in general, maybe a folk hero in an area has a cult-like following. Or maybe even one of your players ends up getting a cult-like following that they find super annoying or super awesome, depending on their personality. Um, <laughs> they can be a really, really great way to add some depth and reality into your campaign. And I certainly hope that you start using them. If you would like that DM Binder page, remember it's down in the description below. If you want more like it, hop on over to Patreon. And until next time, my friends, may your game have advantage. Halfling Hannah here, signing out.